Okay, so we'll begin our standard knee exam, and uh, one part that will not get reflected in the video is that we try to have every patient um, perform both a walking and a jogging gait, if possible. In the face of an injury, that won't be possible, nor will some of the standing components uh, of the exam, but for a, a healthy uh, a walking patient who can tolerate it, we'll take a look at everybody's alignment um, standing up. So first, the patient will stand and face me, and we'll put our, your feet together, please. And here we assess the coronal alignment of the lower extremities, and we can see um, either genu verum or genu valgum, as well as uh, somebody's uh, standing alignment with their feet, such as pes planus or cavus, to see if there's any contribution of the feet to a knee pathology. Um, and here you can see uh, our patient has a very subtle genu verum um, with uh, a couple of finger breaths between the femoral, medial femoral condyles with the malleoli together. And so this is subtle genu verum, but probably within the realm of physiologically normal and nothing particularly concerning from a pathologic standpoint. So next, we'll have you stand uh, with your feet a comfortable distance apart and squat all the way down, bringing your heels up and bringing your behind to your heels. Good. And you can stand up. And a, a variety of knee pathologies um, will make a patient uh, painful uh, when trying to squat, and so I'll have them hold on to the table when they do so and sort of um, squat as far as they can tolerate. So meniscal pathology can be picked up with pain, with hyperflexion, and uh, uh, other problems. So the squatting position is helpful uh, to assess uh, um, certain knee conditions. Next, we'll have you stand on the left foot and do a single leg hop three times. Good, and now we'll have you do the same on the right foot. And a single leg hop can be helpful uh, for assessing sort of how they tolerate uh, impact activities, um, any potential stress fractures of the tibia or femoral neck, if there's an overuse uh, history, and um, the other most important thing about um, uh, the standing uh, uh, alignment uh, view of the knees is just seeing if you see uh, swelling or deformity or other abnormalities. Um, a subtle effusion can sometimes be best assessed just by looking at the knees and assessing the symmetry. So next we'll have the patient uh, lay down and we'll do the um, supine exam of the knee. So the next part of the standard knee exam is actually a hip exam. So with the patient supine, you always want to assess somebody's range of motion of their hips and see if there's any pain with provocative hip maneuvers um, to ensure that you're not missing some underlying hip pathology that may be manifesting itself as hip pain or referred pain from the hip, which is not uncommon in a variety of pathologic hip conditions such as skiffy, um, and other conditions. So uh, for my standard knee exam, everybody's uh, hip gets examined on both sides, um, and I always examine the contralateral knee first. Um, so we'll assume that the left knee is the affected knee or the knee um, for which there are complaints today, and first we'll take a look at the right lower extremity. So first we'll um, do a basic log roll of the hip and see if that's well tolerated, and then flex the hip up, see the max of flexion before the pelvis tilts, and then do internal <clears throat> and external uh, rotation uh, of the hip at 90 degrees. The final step would be doing a um, straight leg raise against resistance and then also checking uh, hyper abduction by putting the foot down and letting the hip fall to the side, stabilizing the pelvis on the left and pushing down on the right. Um, so that's the Faber position. You can pick up some uh, posterior hip or pelvis uh, conditions such as SI, SI joint pathology. So with the hip examined, um, we'll now turn our attention to the knee. And so my standard knee exam uh, uh, first uh, starts by checking range of motion. So we check extension and then hyperextension. We can see that this patient uh, hyperextends by about four uh, degrees or so, which is within the realm of normal. Uh, some kids will uh, hyper hyperextend normally 10 or 15 degrees, which is also normal, provided it's uh, symmetric. Uh, the next steps is I'll turn to a basic Lachman exam, which is our testing of our ACL. So I stabilize the femur uh, with my hands, uh, my thumb, uh, uh, just superior to the patella and my fingers uh, stabilizing the back of the femur and then hold the top of the tibia uh, just uh, at the level of the tibial tubercle. And then I'll um, 
uh, try to relax your muscles if you can, and then I'll um, stabilize the femur and check the anterior and posterior translation of the uh, tibia relative to the femur um, with the knee flexed uh, 20 to 30 degrees. So an ACL tear will lead to a positive Lachman or abnormally uh, anteriorly translating tibia. So to show that again, so we flex about 20 to 30 degrees, try to get the patient to relax, and then anterior translation of the tibia should be asymmetric or abnormally high in an ACL tear. Um, the next thing is we'll check the flexion of the knee. We've checked extension, and we'll see how much somebody can hyperflex. Okay, and so if that's well tolerated, um, then you know that's going to be on the unaffected side. We expect that, and um, in meniscal pathology, hyperflexion of the knee uh, may cause pain. Uh, similarly, hyperextension of the knee will cause pain in meniscal pathology that involves the posterior horn, which is the most commonly affected part of the meniscus. So the next part of the exam is um, going from hyperflexion to about 90 degrees, stabilizing their uh, foot here. And I actually tell the patient that I'm just going to sit gently on their foot. So I place a little bit of pressure to stabilize the foot so I can do an anterior and posterior drawer tests. The anterior drawer tests the anterior cruciate ligament stability. And my thumbs are on the top of the tibial plateau, and my fingers are on the back of the calf. And I actually try to anteriorly translate the tibia relative to the femur. And the patient patient's femur is stabilized just by the weight of their body. And so abnormally, abnormal anterior translation would be a positive uh, anterior drawer, uh, suggestive of an ACL tear. And then in the same <clears throat> fashion, I'll try to posteriorly translate the tibia. And my thumbs on the tibial plateaus should be basically just anterior or in front of um, the femoral condyles on either side, the medial and femoral condyle. And if, they're, uh, if I can move the tibia such that my uh, uh, thumbs can palpate the femoral condyles being anterior to the proximal tibial plateau, then that's a positive posterior drawer. So you should have a solid endpoint anteriorly and posteriorly, and you shouldn't be able to uh, abnormally normally anteriorly translate the tibia or posteriorly translate it relative to the femoral condyles. The normal uh, sort of sitting position of the tibia relative to the femoral condyles is that the tibia is in front of the condyles. So there's a posterior sag sign, which is with a posterior cruciate ligament tear, the tibia may sit behind it and uh, sag abnormally relative uh, to the other side. So we've done our... Um, <clears throat> assessment of range of motion, as well as Lachman anterior and posterior drawer tests. Now we'll uh, assess the joint line tenderness on either side. So the lateral joint line tenderness, I put the edge of my thumb against the um, joint line, which I can feel a little uh, step off between the condyle and the top of the tibial plateau. And so I check in three spots, anterior joint line, straight lateral joint line, and then posterior lateral joint line with either my thumb or the edge of my finger. So um, with meniscal pathology, a meniscus tear, you should feel tenderness or pain there uh, on provocative testing. Similarly, the anterior, uh, sorry, the medial uh, side of the knee is tested with an uh, anteromedial test, straight medial, and then posterior medial. So joint line tenderness is one of the hallmarks of meniscal pathology, so it's important to um, be able to feel that and assess that. Next, um, we'll do what's called a McMurray test, which is where we hold the foot uh, or ankle and um, we stabilize the femur and then rotate externally rotating and internally rotating the tibia relative to the femur. So um, McMurray originally described a snapping phenomenon, so we'll want to put our um, finger and thumb over the joint lines as we did with the joint line tenderness, but just hold it there gently. And if you feel the meniscus snapping, that's a positive McMurray. More commonly, people refer to a positive McMurray uh, these days as pain with that provocative testing. So I always describe it as pain with McMurray testing. But as he originally described it, it's really negative if there's no snapping. Both phenomena can, can be true in the face of a meniscus tear, both the snapping and the pain. The pain may be a little bit more sensitive. <clears throat> so we've checked for meniscal pathology, and next um, we'll just take a look at the patellofemoral relationship. So where the patella sits relative to the trochlear groove or end of the femur. And we'll also... 
um, do what's called a, a lateral patellar apprehension test. So we'll ask them to try to relax your quad muscle there, nice and loose, and we'll check patellar mobility. So we put our finger and thumb on either side of the kneecap and try to translate the uh, patella laterally. So patients who have patellar instability, i.e. they sublux or dislocate their patella, gen generally will um, have a positive apprehension test, which means that they get nervous or experience significant uh, pain when you laterally translate the patella. Now the test is really about apprehension, so it's really the nervousness, but some people with patellar instability or in the wake of a previous dislocation will also have pain. Um, sometimes you get isolated pain, it doesn't make them nervous, it just makes them hurt and that's usually not related to patellar instability. It may be another cause, a patellar bone bruise um, or other uh, issue. Um, people have described the, the medial patellar instability test or apprehension testing, um, but that's extremely rare to have medial patellar instability. It's usually described as only being uh, uh, related to some intervention uh, previous, so as an iatrogenic uh, cause. Um, next, we'll um, just look at other uh, spots on the knee where one wants to palpate. And so, uh, the first uh, that's quite important in kids is the tibial tubercle. Adolescents and pre-adolescents uh, commonly get Osgood-Schlatter syndrome, which would be tenderness in the area of the tibial tubercle, with or without swelling of the tibial tubercle. So you can see this prominence coming up from the anterior tibial crest. So the tibial tubercle will just apply some gentle pressure, and uh, tenderness or pain uh, with that uh, provocative maneuver is usually pretty specific for osteochondritis, uh, correction, for Osgood good Schlatter syndrome. Um, if there's been a tibial tubercle fracture, like a severe acute trauma, that obviously could um, also cause pain there and should be picked up on imaging. So uh, the next thing uh, uh, that we'll palpate is the inferior pole of the patella. So I'll stabilize the patella with my uh, left hand and uh, uh, palpate the inferior pole of the patella in three places, the middle of the inferior pole, the medial of the inferior pole, and the lateral aspect of the inferior pole. And usually if there's tenderness in one of those spots, it's patella tendonitis, though the pediatric uh, form of that condition uh, may be uh, what's called sinding larsen johansson syndrome. And so tenderness in that area in the 7 to 12 year old age group is usually thought to be sinding larsen -Johan johansson syndrome, which is an uh, apophysitis. So the cartilage of the inferior pole of the patella is inflamed because the attachment of the tendon to the um, cartilage or the bone cartilage unit is so strong. So older kids um, may get uh, patellar tendonitis, but younger kids will get sending larsen johansson syndrome, or the middle age group will get osgood schlatter We do see combinations of those uh, on MRI and clinically, and the treatment tends to be the same for all of them. Uh, but differentiating between those three areas is important. The last thing we'll take a look at is whether there's an effusion of the knee. And so uh, this can be very subtle to pick up, uh, but very important. So a lot of knee pathology coming from intra-articular uh, problems such as meniscal pathology, chondral pathology like an osteochondritis desiccans or OCD lesion um, or a cartilage injury um, or fi finally an ACL tear, you'd pick up a small effusion on the knee. So sometimes you can see it grossly as swollen or boggy. Other times, you need to do what's called a little milking maneuver, where you move the fluid, normal synovial fluid or abnormal synovial fluid, over to the lateral gutter and then push uh, uh, the uh, lateral recess of the knee and see if there's a fluid wave right in this area. Okay, so we move it over and then push with our thumb. And here we see just a normal patella and soft tissue moving over rather than a, a poof of the tissue here, which would be consistent with a fluid wave and a positive effusion. We should add, which maybe um, should have been part of the um, early testing. So with range of motion, you're going to check flexion and extension, but then you also want to check varus and valgus stability of the knee in conjunction with Lachman testing, which is your anterior-posterior translation of the tibia relative to the femur. So varus and valgus stressing, uh, stress testing should be done in full extension. So here I support the lateral aspect of the knee with my left hand, and my right hand is on the distal tibia, and I try to um, 
valgusize the uh, knee and see if there's any give. And hers is rock solid as it should be. And then we switch and hold the medial side of the knee and then pull on the tibia um, medially and see if there's any jog or give um, on the lateral side of the knee testing the LCL. So the MCL gets tested with valgus stress testing and the uh, LCL gets tested with Vera stress testing. Now you always want to test it both at uh, full extension and then more importantly in 20 degrees. Okay, so here I'll test the MCL with valgus stress testing and then the LCL with Ver Vera stress testing. <clears throat> so finally we'll come over to the affected side and we were quite deliberate about assessing the contralateral side but we'll show now how everything gets done in sort of real time full speed and just repeat the steps as a review. So first I'll check the hip on the left side or the affected side, do a long roll, um, flex the knee up, see what the uh, hip flexion is, where the pelvis starts to tilt, then I'll check external rotation and internal rotation and then I'll put the foot down and let the uh, knee fall to the side to check hyperabduction in the favor position. And then we'll have you do a straight leg raise and don't let me push down and resist a little bit and there should be no hip pathology. Next, we'll turn our attention to the knee and just take a look at the knee, see if there's any uh, masses, uh, swelling, uh, lumps or bumps, any deformity, which we've also looked at with during the standing exam. Um, but we'll uh, check the extension and we see what the hyperextension is. And she has just a little bit of normal hyperextension. Okay, hopefully no pain. If there is pain, you wonder about uh, meniscal pathology, bone bruising or other pathology. Next, we'll try to have you relax your muscles, bend up 20 degrees and do our Lachman test. So you can see a normal three to four millimeters of translation of that tibia, though there's quite variation in kids. You can have up to five or six uh, millimeters of translation or one to two millimeters of translation. Um, next, we'll check hyperflex, uh, correction, we'll check the varus and valgus stress. So in full extension, we check the uh, valgus stress and the varus stress, and that's normal. And she has a good endpoint with her MCL and her LCL with basic testing. Next, we'll check hyperflexion and see if that bothers you. And if there's pain with hyperflexion, you wonder about meniscal pathology. Next, we'll put the foot down, and I'm just going to sit on your foot for a moment, stabilize that foot, put our uh, two thumbs on the uh, anterior tibial plateau, and check anterior drawer, and then check posterior drawer. And there's a solid endpoint with both without much translation. <clears throat> now we'll check the medial and lateral joint line tenderness. Any pain with that? Any pain over here? Okay. So no joint line tenderness. And then we'll uh, put the uh, uh, knee all the way straight and check the patellofemoral relationship and see if there's any lateral tr uh, patellar translation or apprehension. So she has no apprehension as I do this, so that doesn't make her nervous. We'll check medially doesn't make her nervous. And then we'll palpate a few different spots. First, see if there's any uh, tibial tubercle tenderness. So no pain there. So we start to think there's no osgood schlatter We stabilize the patella and in, uh, palpate the inferior pole in three spots to see if there's any patellar tendonitis or sending larsen johansson syndrome. And then <clears throat> finally check for an effusion. And so we'll uh, milk the uh, medial gutter, a soft uh, uh, a synovial fluid over, and then push on the lateral side and see if there's a soft tissue wave, which is a good way to assess for an effusion.